Hello there, brothers and sisters. God bless each and every single one of you. It is Hunter's Point here with another video. I hope that everybody is doing well so far today. I wanted to go ahead and come on here and do another episode of Love Talk Revisited, so without any further ado, I'm just going to get right into the episode. I got to start with a disclaimer first. So welcome back to Love Talk Revisited, family. This is the video series on love, sex, and dating in our modern world. The show is not a biblical teaching series. None of what I am saying here is thus saith the Lord or anything like that, except for the gospel that I give at the end of this video. Love Talk Revisited is a series where I am able to give my opinion on modern dating, long-term relationships, marriage, love, etc. from a male point of view. The key word there is opinion. I'm not saying that my way is the right way or anything like that. I'm merely giving my opinion on the topics being discussed. If you disagree, then we just agree to disagree and move on. You don't have to agree with my views in this series. You know, my views could be deemed controversial by some, but they're my opinions, they're my views, and to be quite frank, I have facts and statistics that can easily back up what I say in these types of videos. If you agree with me, that's fine. If you disagree, hey, that's fine too. All I ask is that you stay respectful and not attack me as a person for having the views that I have. For today's episode, I wanted to talk about the topics of cohabitation and the micro-divorce. So what is cohabitation and what is the micro-divorce? Well, those are the questions that I will be answering here in this video. Let's start by talking about the topic of cohabitation. I assume most of you watching this video right now already know what cohabitation means. Cohabitation is when two people who aren't married decide to move in together. They are romantically linked and sexually active, which indicates that they are dating one another, but they are not married. I repeat, they are not married. The couple lives together under the same roof, just the two of them, therefore it's cohabitation because they are living together, but they haven't actually gotten married at any point. The vast majority of couples today do this. They move in together during the dating phase. Some couples may wait until marriage, but those are your rare couples that still maintain some level of traditionalism. The chances of you finding a woman today, gentlemen, who won't push cohabitation or marriage on you is like trying to find a golden needle in a silver needle stack. The odds are just not in your favor. Back to cohabitation, though. There are many different scenarios in which cohabitation can occur. First, and this is the most common of the three scenarios that I have noticed, the guy who already owns a house has the girl move in with him. Again, this is the most common scenario of the three. In the second scenario, the girl already owns a house and has the guy move in with her. So this is the opposite, the inverse of the first scenario. This is less common, but it does happen. And last but most certainly not least, the third scenario of the three, they pitch in and buy a house together as a couple. This is the second most common scenario behind the first one. I view cohabitation the same way I view marriage, and I suggest you gentlemen out there do the same. If you're a young man living in modern-day America, my advice is simple. Do not get married. Just don't do it, because if you do, and it ends in a divorce, you will suffer financially like you have never suffered before. And at any moment, she can decide that she's no longer happy and file for divorce, even if you haven't done anything to warrant a divorce. You'll hear that classic line of, I'm not happy. Not saying this is how it always goes down, but it happens like this more often than most people think. The laws are written in a way where guys are most at risk when it comes to divorce, because they are seen as the provider and the main source of income. They're referred to as being the breadwinners. It doesn't matter if the guy was evil and deserved divorce, or if he was a nice guy that was blindsided. The guy loses no matter what. You will be taken through the divorce courts and you will lose at least half of your stuff. No questions asked. There are costs that you will suffer as a result. These costs can be broken down into two categories, direct costs and indirect costs. Direct costs can be split into physical assets and liquid assets. Physical assets can include furniture, appliances, household goods, cars, technology, etc., Liquid assets can include your life savings, 401k retirement plan, mutual funds, bonds, stocks, personal savings, cash, as well as the equity of the home, just to name a few. Indirect costs will include things that most people don't even consider when getting married. These indirect costs can include mental health problems, 
emotional turmoil, low self-worth, panic attacks, high stress, high anxiety, and so on and so forth. These are just a few of the indirect costs that come from going through a divorce. Understand this, you will be worse off financially post-divorce than you were pre-marriage. That's the reality of marriage in our modern world. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back of the room. You will be worse off financially post-divorce than you ever were pre-marriage. That's the reality of modern marriage in our present world. So why bring up marriage? Because society, and more importantly, the government, views marriage the same way that they view cohabitation. So gentlemen, just as you shouldn't marry, you shouldn't cohabitate. Married couples that live together don't have to deal with the cohabitation laws because they are married. So they deal within the terms of their marital contract. Unmarried couples who are cohabitating, on the other hand, have to deal with cohabitation laws. Often has to do with civil court. Family law governs married couples. Contract law governs unmarried couples living together. There are laws state by state that deal with cohabitation, so it definitely varies a bit. None of them really benefit the men, though. You'll see that as you do more extensive research on cohabitation. So what happens if a couple who is living together decides to break up? In the same way that 60% of marriages end in divorce in the United States every year, 80% of unmarried relationships end in breakup. This is where the micro-divorce comes into play. To the guys out there, if you decide to move in with your girlfriend in her place, you are putting yourself at risk. If you and her decide to get a house together, you are putting yourself at risk. No matter what, you are risking your financial stability if you move in with a modern woman. Because in the event that she breaks up with you and her name is on the apartment or the house that you were all staying in, then she's going to make you move on and will likely even keep some of the property that was in the place. And God forbid the house is in her name only. Then she gets the house as well. And assuming it goes to the local courts, it's not going to end well for you. Whether it's just her name on the property or both your names are on the property, the courts are going to side with her nine times out of ten. That will happen way more often than it won't. The courts will award her the living space and order a division of assets. If you're lucky, the only assets you will be able to keep are the assets that you had before entering into the relationship. Again, this doesn't happen in each and every single case, but it happens a lot, especially here in America. And I see it happen just as much within other countries here in the Western world, especially if the courts are involved. I've seen men quite literally lose everything after being taken through the court system. So don't cohabitate. Even if you're unmarried but are cohabitating and she throws you out, you will suffer a net loss of assets and resources as a result. In other words, you will have gone through a micro-divorce as opposed to the real thing. Still not good. Remember, gentlemen, the only true prenup is not getting married in the first place. I wanted to go ahead and finish this video by sharing the gospel with you all. The gospel is found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4, and it reads as follows. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel, the good news, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. You are saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption the nanosecond that you place your faith and trust in that gospel alone. That gospel alone is what saves you. It's not your performance or your behavior or your you know willingness to follow the commandments or obey the law. None of those things save you. None of those things play any role in salvation whatsoever. Uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and read Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, which says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace, by definition, is getting what we don't deserve, which God has offered to us as the free gift of salvation. And we accept and receive that free gift once and for all, past, present, and future, 
by faith alone in the finished redemptive work of Jesus Christ alone. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, by believing the gospel, the gospel that I shared with you in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God the Son, the second part of the Trinity. He died on the cross, shedding his precious purifying blood for the remission of all mankind's sins, that's past, present, and future sins. He was buried in the tomb three days, proving that he was dead, and he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, for our justification and therefore our salvation. By simply believing in Christ alone, we can obtain the free gift of salvation, with emphasis being placed on the free gift portion of that phrase, because that's what salvation is. It wouldn't be a, a gift if you had to work for it. It wouldn't be free either. But salvation is the free gift of God offered to us so that we may accept by grace through faith. I'm going to finish by reading John 3, verse 16 to 18, and then I'll go ahead and close out the video. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is the gospel. You are saved, sealed, and sanctified with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, the nanosecond that you place your full faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So I pray that if you're a non-believer, watching this video right now that you would believe on Christ for salvation and eternal security. Believe in his death, burial, and resurrection because salvation is just as simple as that. All right, so I'm going to leave you guys off there. I will see you guys in the next video should the Lord tarry his coming. Otherwise, God bless.